good here. So obviously we appreciate the chance to come down here and do a little training for you guys before the meeting. So um, Paul's request, uh, what we've tried to do here is provide a presentation that kind of goes over the plan review process that you all have in place. Uh, just kind of look at each step as we go through that process and what are the elements that are part, uh, part of each step and uh, part of each of those steps and kind of what's the role of staff, what's the role of planning commission and well as the BOC if, if they're required in any particular uh, type of project. Um, so really kind of the, it'll be kind of in four, uh, four parts here in terms of the training. And so this is kind of what we're gonna, first of all, we'll do a little background on this to begin with. So we'll do kind of a look at planning and planning and zoning. Uh, we'll begin kind of what's, how are they similar? How are they different? Uh, and then after that, we'll, uh, we'll move on to how can we plan and zone? So this is just looking at legal basis for planning and zoning, how we can do what we do. Um, and then next we'll do, uh, look at the five primary documents that you all as a city has adopted that provides the regulations or one, the plan uh, to direct all planning and zoning, but also to the regulatory documents that you all have adopted uh, just for regulating and reviewing and approving uh, development here in the city. And then the final part is obviously the most, the main part that we're gonna look at and that's the say the Fairview project review process or the development review process. And so we'll go through each of those steps and look a little bit more in depth on those. So these first few is really just kind of a background and to kind of get us into it. Uh, so we will start with planning versus zoning. And usually what I do, and we won't necessarily have to do this tonight, but uh, it's usually what I do is go around the room, ask people if they're willing to answer the question, what is planning? And my point in doing that is usually if we asked everybody in here, we would probably all get a little bit different definition of what planning is. Now, they would all be probably be related. They would be focused on different things. Uh, but the idea is just looking at what is planning, how do people define planning. So in this regard, and these, these are just three examples I found online. Uh, so they kind of get progressively detailed, more detailed as you get to the right. Uh, the first one is probably the most basic definition of planning, uh, just control of construction and growth. Uh, within a community. The second one, it gets a little bit closer, a little bit more in depth or a little bit different perspective and talks about it. it's a problem solving, it's a process making informed decisions. So it's looking a little bit more to the process and, and being informed of decisions that you need to make in this process. Then finally, you know, adds in a little bit more, um, you know, it talks about it's a technical process and it's a political process. So again, these are just ways to look at what is planning. And so obviously we can look at it, it's gonna be control, but it's really looking at a process that communities have in place to review what development is. The reason I say that is most of the time planning, the word planning and zoning can many times be interchangeable or is, they are interchanged, but they're not necessarily the same thing. And I kind of always, I always like to start out with this and get an understanding of what they are, how they're different, how they complement one another. Uh, so start with planning, so then we'll go to, uh, so what, what is zoning? So again, just three more definitions that, you know, Pretty good, a good description of, of zoning. And to get a little more detail or a little different perspective as you, as you go across the screen, um, I think the first one again is usually probably what most people think. Zoning is gonna look at your community. It's gonna be across the entire community. It's gonna divide every property or every part of your community by property level by a particular zone. Again, this is nothing that you all don't interact with that you don't understand, but usually that's the way probably the most general idea and de general definition of zoning. Um, so the second one talks about zoning as a tool. So it looks more than just, hey, we're gonna zone something, but it looks at this is a tool to create something. It's a tool to get to an end, whatever that end may be. Uh, and then the final, it talks about the process. So again, we're getting back to the idea of this is a process. Zon zoning is a tool, but it's also a process. It's not simply, okay, we've got property and every property in the city has a zone on it. It's much deeper to that. There's much more detail to that. So again, planning and zoning, looking at the different definitions, and then ultimately what I want to get to is, you know, what is the difference between the two? Um, so I'm a visual learner, and I like how to use things to illustrate. And so this is how I think about planning and zoning, and essentially how they're different, but also how they complement one another. So if you think about planning, and you look at a paint by numbers, a plan or a planning aspect of things is really kind of the squiggly lines. The squiggly lines are there to eventually give you a vision what the final product will be on paint by numbers. But inside of the squiggly lines, you're gonna have numbers. 
And those numbers tell you exactly what paint to put where so that you will eventually get to your final completed vision. So the way to look at this and the way I look at this is planning is the squiggly lines, the numbers are the zoning, and it's your regulations. So your plan for your community, and you all's case, the 2040 plan, has created a vision. You all have a vision for your community here in Fairview. And your zoning ordinance and the other ordinance documents we'll look at here in a minute, those are like the numbers inside the squiggly lines. Those are the tools and the mechanisms that will bring about your vision for your community. So again, I'm a visual learner, so I just like this as an illustration of planning and zoning is not exactly the same, but they are complementary, and zoning helps you match or create and get to the end of the, the vision, whatever your plan has for your community. Try to start off a little bit of that. So again, I don't want to get too much into the legal part of things, but at least wanted everybody to see. So how can we plan? So we can look at planning, we can look at zoning, but obviously we need to be able to legally do what we do. Obviously, we know we, are, we can do this, uh, but the idea here is just to look at the actual text or the ideas of how we can plan. So there's really three powers that a community has that allows them to do planning, zoning, and review of development. Uh, so we have corporate power, again, able to levy taxes, fees, things of that nature, put those towards uh, facilities, utilities, uh, different aspects of the community. Uh, probably, the, probably the primary uh, way that we are able to plan uh, and probably the, what we'll look at specifically is uh, your police power. And so this is a power that's reserved to the states by the U.S. Constitution. And then the states then provide that to cities and counties that they can be able to regulate through zoning and regulate in other, way, other capacities as well. And so kind of the state enabling legislation on the right-hand side of the screen is really just the Tennessee version of what the police power is. This is the state of Tennessee giving cities and counties the ability to have a planning commission, the ability to have a zoning ordinance, and the ability to regulate uh, property, private property. Uh, so this is, this is kind of a look at the ways in which a community can legally uh, review and actually set up planning commission and design review for uh, your zoning regulations. So we're not gonna read all of this, but uh, just want you all to see state enabling legislation here in Tennessee. This is the actual text uh, within Tennessee code annotated that gives the right for you all to uh, establish a planning commission. It says they may create an establishment planning commission. So obviously a community isn't required to have a planning commission, but this does give a community the ability to do so if they so choose. <clears throat> now beyond just given the ability to set up a planning commission, uh, this is the text specifically that is the grant of power from TCA that allows communities to actually set up and create your actual zoning ordinance. And this uh, directs, in terms of this directs and gives parameters to actually what you can uh, regulate in terms of your, your zoning ordinance. And so I underlined and bolded this one section and, and just to give you an idea of how broad and, and really general uh, the state law is and which therefore gives you all a lot of uh, latitude in terms of what can be regulated. And so regulate location, height, bulk regulations, number of stories or the size of buildings, size of yards, courts, open spaces, density. Obviously these are all things that we all regulate through your zoning ordinance. Uh, and so again, this is just the actual text from state law that allows you to be able to do those things. And, give you that. Uh, and also put some limitations on what you all can review. The next is that we're just going to talk a little bit about the Fairview, the documents you all have in place. So these are the five really primary documents that you all have adopted as a city uh, to regulate development as it comes in. Again, I don't think this is really a surprise for anybody in the room, but just to look at them and, and understand a little bit about each one of them, I wanted to, I wanted to touch on each one of them a little bit. Uh, so kind of going back to the idea of the paint by numbers and the squiggly lines, that being your vision for your community, uh, that's really your Fair, uh, Fairview Ford 2040 plan. So that's your plan document that has created the vision for your community. Um, and then it goes forward, it goes to the right, and you get your zoning ordinance, subdivision regulations, uh, your design review manual, and then your stormwater ma uh, management ordinance. Now, obviously, the four to the right are your actual regulatory documents. So those are kind of the numbers inside those squiggly lines. Those are the documents and regulations that will help bring about the vision for your community here. So the first one we'll talk about is the 2040 plan. And what is it? What does it do? So uh, I think you all probably understand this a little bit. Uh, you were part of the process. 
but uh, it's intended to guide city decisions. Uh, the key here is that your 2040 plan is not a regulatory document. You actually don't zone from your 2040 plan. Uh, there's really no regulations within that plan. It's a more of a policy plan. It sets policy for your community. It sets policy and direction for decisions you all make, but it doesn't actually provide the regulatory or regulations within it that actually you would reference in terms of how, would, how a particular de development will be designed or laid out. So again, your 2040 plan sets that vision, sets those policies in place that will guide you all in your decisions, but it won't necessarily regulate specific specifics of a development itself. So you see it under applicability. This was a quote taken from the 2040 plan, and you know, right there in the beginning, uh, underlines this make recommendations. Uh, obviously, looks at transportation, future land use, uh, your community facilities. And so again, this is a document that will make recommendations in terms of future land use. That's probably the one that you all most commonly see. Have a development come in. They desire to do a certain type of development and location. Staff, we're going to look at that. We're going to say, hey, 2040 plan says it's this classification for future land use. Within that, there are appropriate zoning districts. There are appropriate uh, land uses. So we're going to make recommendations to you all based on seeing that. You all will be able to look at that and see, does this meet appropriate zoning districts? Does it meet the appropriate? Again, making those recommendations, but not necessarily, not necessarily regulating from the document. Obviously, we're going we're gonna to review, we're going to reference this document uh, when we review projects. Obviously, it's available to you all as well uh, when you review projects. You might look at as uh, the future transportation plan in there, the major thoroughfare plan. Are there particular road projects that are, that are proposed for the future? Or is there any transportation when a new project comes in? Something that we need to be on the front end, be able to tell a developer when they first come in, hey, this is a project that we see coming in the future. Uh, this is going to require widening of the road or this is going to require an extension or, or whatever it may be. So this document also provides that type of information uh, for staff to be able to interact with developers in the front end when we start having discussions with about projects and potential transportation impacts, uh, either new projects or just general transportation impacts on a, on a project that may come forward. Uh, so the next document is the zoning ordinance. Again, this is the specific regulations in terms of each property in your city has a particular zone on it. Each zone has their own specific regulations, uh, whether that be lot size, lot width, setbacks, yard lines, um, lot coverage, all of this uh, that are this in the zoning ordinance. So that's the, this is obviously the most uh, probably well-known document you all would have. Most people in the community would understand you have the zoning ordinance and what it does. I'm not going to spend a lot of time, obviously, you will interact with this on, on a monthly basis. Uh, next, we have subdivision regulations. So subdivision regulations, again, are requirements and regulations. Uh, however, it's different than zoning ordinance. You're getting more technical. This is specific to subdivision process. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean a residential subdivision, but subdivision of any property within the community. So it's going to establish that process. Uh, if someone has property and they want to subdivide it for commercial uses, it's still gonna to have to follow the established process for subdivision of, of property, which is found within the subdivision regulations. Um, it, under applicability, right there, uh, has a quote from your subregs, applies to all subdivisions located within corporate boundaries of Fairview, Tennessee. So it doesn't necessarily have to be residential in use, it can also be commercial in use as well, or industrial. Uh, obviously in subdivision regulations, there's a lot of other information in there as well, technical information about block length, cul-de-sac length. You're going to have information about uh, utilities, information about stormwater. You're going to have information about a lot of the technical aspects of the actual development and the design of the development, which will go deeper than just the regulations of the zoning ordinance itself. Um, so again, really think about it is, is your plan is very broad. Your zoning ordinance is very specific to the property. And then your subdivision regulations, they're going to be specific as well. And as we go through these documents, they get a little bit more specific and they get a little more focused on what their topic is. So that, that's one way to think, of, think about these as you go through them. They all coordinate together, but they all have a very specific focus on what they regulate and what they look at. The so next we have the design review manual. Again, we can look at this. Obviously, it gets a little more specific. Now we're looking at the site. Uh, we're looking at existing trees. We're looking at landscaping. We're looking at buffering screening of, of structures. Uh, we're also looking at uh, landscaping in the parking area, looking at signage, also, and obviously the architectural design of the building. So we can see now we've, we've 
we've got the property zone, now we've, we've gone through the subdivision process potentially. Now we're looking at actual specific site elements, site design. Uh, so again, this is the document for that. This is, this is gonna be applied to any development that requires a site plan. Uh, this is found in Design Review Manual 1-101.4. Uh, under administration, you can see on the screen uh, when uh, staff will reference this, and it says, quote, development requiring site plan approval by planning commission. That's and that's found in Zoning Ordinance 16104, 17103. Again, it's referenced in both documents, subregs and, uh, or I'm sorry, Design Review Manual and Zoning Ordinance. So uh, staff's gonna have to use this and, and reference this when any type of uh, development comes in uh, for these purposes. The final one we have is our stormwater management ordinance. Kidding. Maybe it worked. There we go. So the purpose of the stormwater management ordinance uh, is manage the quality of stormwater uh, runoff from sewer system, storm sewer systems. Make sure you're in compliance with all your requirements, uh, MS4 requirements. Um, best way to look at it is it says administered jointly by uh, your engineering department, planning, and codes, and public works. So really to look at is Polar Works is gonna maintain your system, your infrastructure. Uh, engineering is gonna issue the permits for work in the right of way, issue permits for land disturbance. Um, this is gonna include grading permits, site utilization, erosion control, uh, and then planning and codes is gonna coordinate the plan review of the new developments. So this is kind of a easy way to look at how each three departments or the three department individual departments will utilize the stormwater management ordinance and how they coordinate to manage the stormwater program here in, in the city. And I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on these. I know you all see these and interact with them a good bit, but I want to have an overview of this to understand these are your five primary documents that staff's going to use. You all would reference. Uh, obviously, there may be other things that staff will review. Uh, we're going to look at uh, any type of floodplain maps. We will look at urban growth boundary maps. We will look at your zoning map. So there's other, other documents or maps that we would reference in terms of staff usage and you all as well, uh, that may not be included within these particular documents. But again, these are the primary ones that we just want to kind of go over a little bit before we get into this. So the idea behind uh, looking at the project review process was um, first looking at the idea of how many steps will there be. And so uh, I didn't go too detailed on this, uh, but just an overview. You're looking at about seven primary steps that you're going to have in what is really the most intensive review process that you all have. And so obviously you have different review processes for non-residential development. Uh, uh, residential developments that would be more of a base zone and not go for an overlay district. Uh, those processes would be a little shorter, uh, but the purpose for the purpose of the training tonight, we just wanted to look at what would be the most intensive one. So we're gonna presume that someone come in and they wanna come in with a planned overlay district. Maybe they have a piece of property and they wanna do a residential development and they want to be the planned overlay district. And so that's kind of the basis of what we, th we thought we would go through tonight. What's the most intensive? What would have the most steps? Um, and so first of all, you look at, you know, essentially there's seven steps or seven components of a plan review process. And we'll go through a little bit more detail on each one of these. Uh, that's correct. Yeah, other communities, uh, SP is a, uh, well, I shouldn't say a little different. Depends on the community you're in, in terms of an SP. Um, some communities, SP is almost like, you just come show us what you wanna do. Uh, there's almost no regulation to it at all. Other communities, there's minimal regulation of what an SP is. And uh, PUDs normally have a lot more uh, stringent kind of step-by-step -step process and what are the requirements, much more similar to, to what you all have here as a pod. So I would say what you all have here as a pod would be very comparable to a PUD. In other communities, uh, SPs just really depend on the community. Um, I know some are just, come tell us what you want to do and we'll just kind of talk about it, which seems really uh, scary to me. Um, and you also have master plan zones, which uh, some communities have what are called master plan zones, which are also very close to what you all hear as a pod as well. Again, it's terminology. Different communities use different terminology. So, But yes, they're, they're very similar to what you would have in those other communities. So kind of the first step we would have here is just the initial meeting. So this is, there's a property owner, a developer, uh, and the property owner together has discussed, and uh, there's an interest in developing residentially in Fairview. Uh, they have a piece of property. They have a general idea of what they want to do. 
And so they're gonna call up Ethan and they'll say, Ethan, hey, we wanna come talk to you about a, this piece of property. We wanna talk about this development that we have an interest in doing. And so this is really your first step that is going to occur in this process. And this is really just an opportunity for them to come in, meet with Ethan, Ethan meet with them, understand what they're desiring to do, but also for Ethan to be able to set expectations and give them direction and understanding on what are the general parameters and general requirements the city has for this particular piece of property. Um, first, the first question, first thing it needs to establish is, is it even in the city limits? If it's not in the city limits, obviously it's gonna have to go through the annexation process. Gonna have to go through the annexation process or not, uh, then there'll be obviously a discussion of what zoning is on the property currently or what would they want to zone it if they're annexing in or going through the rezoning process. Um, those are important, obviously, to understand, um, to be able to, if it's not in the city and you want to annex it, then we have to determine that it's actually in the urban growth boundary. If it's not, then it's not possible to annex in. We need to establish that to begin with in this meeting. Um, Ethan's going to look at uh, what they want to zone it to. He's gonna reference the 2040 plan. Uh, this property has uh, been deemed whatever the classification is, future land use classification, this. He's gonna be able to clearly indicate that and provide that to the developer or property owner. Say, hey, these are the types of developments that are really appropriate on this property. These are the zoning districts that are appropriate on this property. So again, Ethan's being able to set expectation and be able to guide them from the very beginning on what this development really should be in this location within Fairview based on uh, really, at this point in time, you're really basing it on the 2040 plan, and then maybe a little bit into your zoning ordinance in terms of what would be appropriate zoning for that particular property. Um, and th there's not a whole lot to this initial meeting in terms of uh, depth, in terms of there's no plan to really show. Uh, obviously, you all, Planning Commission and, and Board of Commissioners, are not part of this. This is just this initial step, initial contact with the city. So after this meeting, Ethan's going to give them the next steps. What's your next steps? We're going to presume for tonight, obviously, they're outside the city limits, and Ethan's determined that this private property is in the urban growth boundary uh, and contiguous to the existing city uh, limits, and so this is a property that could potentially be annexed. Into the city. So the next step would be uh, the developer and or owner, applicant, whomever it's going to be, they're going to come in and they're going to uh, submit for uh, the annexation of the property into this is really the first uh, step of the process where anybody outside staff will be involved. Uh, at this point in time, annexation is going to come to staff. It will also come to you all in planning commission and then board of, development, board of commissioners as well. Again, this has already been done at the initial meeting, but uh, verifying that it's within urban growth boundary, allowing it to be annexed in. Um, staff is going to create a plan of services. How is the city going to be able to serve this property when it comes in? cover, fire, police, trash, uh, utilities, school, um, anything's done to you, you know, even zoning and planning services. So how is the city going to be able to serve uh, this property if it's an extent? Staff is going to create that staff report. They're going to create those plan of services uh, documents. They're going to provide those to you all. Come in with a uh, staff report. They're going to provide uh, direction in terms of a recommendation for you all. Um, that can be based on what's the 2040 plan. This is appropriate to have residential in this area. Uh, this idea behind having a residential development this area matches up with uh, the 2040 plan in this regard. Now, obviously, no one, uh, they're not required to come in with any type of plan for the annexation request. They don't have to. You'll at least kind of know what they want to do there so you can have an Type of development that's coming in. So this will obviously come to you all, plan of services. And your role in this is obviously, and you, you all know this, you've, you've done this plenty of times, your role in this is to review, review this information, determine if you all feel like this is an appropriate action for the city to annex this property. Just because someone comes before you and requests annexation, there is no mandate that you actually bring it in. You can make the decision to make a recommendation against the annexation. You may be able to look at it and deem it as Feel like the city can service this. We don't feel like the city can serve this with more utilities. We don't feel like we have enough police, fire, EMS to service this property, whatever the situation may be. So this is an opportunity for you all to be able to look at that and determine the city can make, meet services. Is the idea of what they're wanting to do there um, appropriate? Does it match the 2040 plan? All this information for you all coming together and making a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners. Uh, your recommendation is going to be 
one of two things. It's going to be affirmative or for it or negative against. So you all have really two choices. You can make a positive or negative recommendation to uh, the board of, uh, board of Commissioners. Uh, once the Board of Commissioners gets this, this information, uh, they'll have final decision on annexation. And take your recommendation into consideration, but they're not bound to match your recommendation. Or they can make their own decision. But we feel like it should be annexed, or they can say we feel like it shouldn't be annexed. So it's up to there since they're the legislative body of the city of Fairview. They would make Obviously, we, you all know this, but two readings in a public hearing for Board of, board of the Commissioners uh, for Annexation laws changed a number of years ago. Things are a little different. Um, it is now done by resolution, not ordinance. It has to be done by owner consent. Uh, you can't just go out and annex it. Got hired. They just finished a seven and a half square mile annexation. It didn't matter who was in favor of it. They just annexed seven and a half square miles. That is out the window. That's been out the window for years now. That's not and in terms of the process, it'll be by resolution and not by ordinance, which is a little wonky because for communities that bring an annexation and rezoning at the same time, and rezoning is by ordinance and annexation is by you kind of end up being on two different paths there. Um, the owner consent, you can do a referendum, but um, I don't know if anybody that's actually done that yet. I don't know if anybody would want to do that. I don't know. There's Unfortunately, there's not a lot of detail in state law as far as what is required to hold that referendum. Who gets the ability to vote? I mean, it has, I think as general wording, I people in the general area of the property. Well, what does that mean? Is that 100 feet? Is that 500 feet? Is that half a mile? Well, there's really no clear indication of general area. Who gets to vote in that referendum? Is it just the property owner who wants it? Or is it just the property owner and the adjacent properties? You know, there's really no clear indication of that in state law. So I don't know of any communities that have done a referendum. And I don't, again, there's not a clear process on exactly how you would do that. Uh, I just know it's very different than it used to be. And then, uh, very different now. Um, MTAS, I'm sure y'all heard of MTAS, they've, they actually have a kind of what they call their best practices for annexation, uh, and they have created this 26-step process that is a best practices to follow state law now. Um, it's not mandated. Uh, you don't have to follow their exact process, but uh, it is very different than previous years, for sure. There's only 26 steps, and really there's probably only two steps that involve you all and the Board of Commissioners. <laughs> and so uh, maybe three steps. Um, you know, that actually recommends that the initial uh, annexation request goes to Board of Commissioners first. And for them to actually say, yes, they want the Planning Commission to study the annexation and give a recommendation, or they don't. So MTAS's recommendation or their best practices actually says you should take the BOC first. Let them actually make the decision, should this even go forward or not. And if they so choose, they say, yes, we want Planning Commission to study this and provide us a recommendation. So then it would go to you all. You would make a recommendation, then we'd go back to BOC. So again, it's not mandated by state law, but that is what MTAS states as they feel is best practices based on what current law is now, or the updated annexation laws. So again, that's, that's not recommendation, uh, not mandated. Uh, it's just their statement of, hey, we think this is best practice. So, Can you talk a little bit about non-contiguous areas? Yeah. Because that's kind of what we're talking about. Yeah, so, uh, now you can actually do non-contiguous. In the past, there really wasn't anything you could do. Uh, you would see a lot of communities where you would just annex the right of way and then get out to just the property you wanted to get to. Uh, so a community would go annex this whole long right of way, but no adjacent properties just to get, most of them a commercial industrial property to be able to get the taxes off of that. So um, now uh, you are permitted by state law to be able to annex non-contiguous properties. So property does not have to be contiguous to your current city limits. Um, no minimum or maximum distances that I know of. Do you know, Will? I don't think there is. Is in your urban growth? Yeah, urban, that's, that's, kind of the, that's kind of the overarching thing, is in your urban growth boundary, then it's essentially up for annexation. Um, obviously, that brings up a lot of questions. Just last month, 
Who owns the road? Who maintains the road? Well, is the city now going to be required to take over maintenance of that road? Is this going to be bringing, it may be fine, we may be able to serve that property X feet away or half a mile away or a mile away, but now is the city also going to incur additional maintenance issue or cost because of now we're going to have to maintain this road? Not because we're annexing the road, but just because now the county is going to have to maintain this road. So it is possible, uh, but obviously with every annexation, you really need to be able to look at is it beneficial for the city to do so? Outside of just generally like, hey, this property looks good, we can serve this property, but being non-contiguous, um, you know, response times, who's gonna respond? Um, that can always be an issue. Who's gonna respond in an emergency? Understanding how, what that's gonna be, understanding maintenance. I mean, there's just a lot of things that can come into play with doing non-contiguous. Uh, again, if you so choose to do one, you can now legally, but through state law, but, um, Maybe not the best idea. Maybe not the best idea. Just because there's so many variables that you're not sure about that can come up, that can pop up by having something that you're gonna have to serve that's not contiguous to your current, maybe utilities, maybe it is connected to the same utilities, maybe it's not. It's possible, but maybe not the best practice to, to hinge it on. We're going to presume that, in this case, we're going to presume that VOC uh, will say you all recommend approval of the annexation. VOC, <coughs> excuse me, VOC uh, also concurs with you all's recommendation, and the VOC is going to approve this uh, annexation into the city. Um, these are just a few few points here. Obviously, the VOC they can deny or they can approve or deny the annexation. Obviously, they can defer for any amount of time. You all can defer as many for amount of time that you all see fit if you need additional information to make your decision. Um, if you feel like you do not have enough information to make the decision, you're more than, more than in the right to be able to defer, to be able to gain that information, direct staff or direct applicant to be able to get that information to you. Uh, because obviously you want to make, you all want to make the informed decision, but ultimately your applicant wants you to make the informed decision as well. Because if you don't have all the information and you don't make a decision that is appropriate and correct, then that may, been, may not benefit them either. It may it's a mutual benefit for everybody to have all the information necessary. So you all can defer uh, for a reasonable amount of time to get the information you need. BOC can do the same. Um, and once it's approved, then obviously now they can come in with uh, their rezoning request. Uh, I don't know if I did this very well in this section or not, because there's essentially two different types of rezonings we can have here. And so uh, a little bit going into the, the planned overlay district. So. Um, so as I say, really an owner and applicant has two options here when it comes into uh, City of Fairview in terms of rezoning. So they can go for just a base zone. These are your zones that are established in uh, Section 5101 of the Zoning Ordinance. Or they can come in and request a planned overlay district, and that's specific in Article 10 of the Zoning Ordinance. So when someone comes in and they say, well, I'm going to rezone property here, uh, these are their, their options they have. Uh, so in, in 5101, there's 23 different base zones, uh, residential, commercial, and industrial, that someone can choose from in terms of how they want to rezone their property. Uh, if they go with a base zone, it, this is just a standard rezoning submittal for that. It does not require a master development plan, uh, and technically no information required for the actual design or layout of the project as well. Um, if that comes in, then it's going to go through the same process of annexation. It will come to you all for recommendation and then it will move on to BOC for their final approval. Uh, the other option that, uh, that you all y'all have here, and that this is kind of what we're going through in this scenario, is the over, over, uh, overlay zone district. And this is the other option that an individual has to request here in the city of Fairview. Uh, if someone chooses to do the plan overlay district, they will do their submission requesting rezoning, but in this case, it's gonna require them to create a master development plan. Um, I didn't actually do a separate slide for master development planning, so I figured we're just gonna kind of talk about this because it's so part of the rezoning. It, it is a required part of the rezoning. So um, it's not really a separate step. It's just part of the rezoning step here. Um, so this master development plan, uh, as far as the requirements, they're, they're outlined in section 10 of the zoning ordinance. And so again, it's gonna have the same similar review process uh, when it comes to uh, any the annexation or just a base zone rezoning. It's gonna come to you all uh, for review, recommendation, and then to the VOC for final review and approval. Um, if I did the next. 
So I think so this is kind of where I wanted to talk a little bit more about this. So master plan is really probably the most important step for you all in terms of establishing what that development will look like. This, the master development plan is essentially, the way I think about it, is essentially setting up a quote zoning, zoning ordinance just for this development. This is establishing uh, the specific zoning parameters and design and regulation parameters for this particular development. So when it comes to you all, it comes to staff, it comes to BOC, you know, this is really the foundational part of creating what this development is gonna look like in the end. So for you all, this is really the time to be looking at you know, what are they looking at in terms of lot sizes, you know, look at densities, look at layout, look at uh, road networks, because uh, this, is, this is establishing, like I said, essentially a zoning ordinance and the zoning regulations are very specific to this development and this property. Um, and for you all, you know, this is the point in time to do that, uh, because once this is approved and established um, and approved by the BOC, then this really doesn't have to change. This is not required to change unless the owner developer decides to come in and modify the project. That's when your master development plan would change. Um, once it's approved and it's established, there's really, for the most part, doesn't ha it doesn't have to change. It may never change um, at that point in time unless they they voluntarily choose to make d changes to that master development plan. So that's why it's so important uh, for staff and, and for you all in the BOC to really focus on this step of the process. Um, <clears throat> Uh, because this, once this gets established, everything is going to fall under this and needs to match this. And so if it doesn't really kind of get in the plan at this step, it's going to be, you're going to kind of miss an opportunity in the future to some degree to be able to work on the overall design and layout and parameters of this of a project. So the master development plan, when it comes in through the rezoning, is a crucial step for everybody to really dig in and, and look at and make sure you're thinking through what this is going to look like in the end, both for staff and for you all and the BOC as well. So if someone if someone brings it to Master Valley Plan, Planning Commission, you all provide negative recommendation. So, yeah, I mean they they can move forward with it as is, and essentially at that point in time, they are just saying, "Hey, we're going to move forward. We want to go to BOC as this is as it is now." Uh, maybe they feel confident. They maybe they feel like they can get an approval of it. Uh, maybe they're just like, you know what, we're, we're just going to move forward no matter what. We just want to see what happens. Um, obviously, the BOC can. And can they can recommend or they can approve as is, they can deny, uh, they can also require modifications of it as well. Uh, they can also send it back to you all for further discussion as well if they want to do that. Uh, they want to maybe get you all to come back or maybe they say we want you to go back and, and work with staff and want you to go back and work with uh, the planning commission to be able to look at this and maybe potential, here's some issues we're hearing from the public, here's some issues that we think are, occur, are going to occur on this site, so we want you to go back and look at it. So BOC can do that, you all can do that as well. Uh, they're not required to make any changes you all are recommending to them at that point in time. Um, they can go move forward as, as they desire. Again, obviously, if it gets there and it gets turned down, then they, they don't have anything to show for their efforts at that point in time. Um, obviously, it's still, still an opportunity for you all to uh, make your recommendations and, and make your basis why. And obviously, that's going to go forward in the record to BOC so they can understand why you all may be sending it forward as, hey, we, we recommend this, but here's some issues we think are occurring with this plan. Uh, it could be topography, it could be stormwater, it could be uh, road system, road network, um, it could be intersections that are being created with existing roads that aren't adequate or up to, up to speed, whatever it may be. So those are, those are obviously recommendations and comments you all can send forward uh, with your recommendation to BOC as well. Well, 
you turn it down, there's feedback. Try on that, or yeah, just yes, sir. I think that's why it's important that um, you know Brandon and I sit on the board, on the planning commission because we can in the board of commission meetings we can explain what was discussed okay. in the planning. If no, if neither one of us. You know, we're on the. It, it'd be different. We, I would suggest that we all review the planning commission uh, meeting that discussed that item. Right, but since we both sit on it, then you know we're able to um, explain to the other board members, you know, what was said and why they why the planning commission came to the. Or if it's a you know split vote or something, maybe. Explain a little more in depth about maybe why it was so close. There's been a lot of straight zoning that's come to that's Zoning does not obligate that applicant to what they presented to you. They have no vested right to proceed with the code in that conception. As an example, this has already been voted on approved, so you know it's not changing. But um, Meadowood and Westway Apartments. So the people, when that was zoned, the people were shown this plan for the whole development. It was all going to be condos, and you know that's the way it was going to be. So they bought into this, not knowing that later, because it didn't have you know, the plan development with it, that now they've decided to do apartments. Uh, whatever style apartments they are, um, you know, they did apartments and now these people are upset, but, you know, they were given information that it was gonna be a certain way, but because of it didn't have the overlay 
they were able to change it to a policy. That's, it, it, Understand that you know, we're going to do arm 12, and hey, we're going to put you know condos all on here, and then they change their mind and they do all apartments. They can do that if we don't mm -hmm. have that. And I call it a pod. I can't wrap my head around pod, but anyway, um, if we don't have that as a part of it, then. That's the reason we have steered away from the commercial so that, you know, there isn't a list a mile long and they sell it and we thought it was going to be this and now it's a whatever. So we're more tight and stringent on our commercial zones that it, you know, it's just a few uses under each one and they have to say what that use is going to be. It helps us to have more control as a city to, you know, see what we're doing. Right. Okay. So one thing I'll add, Will talked about uh, the vesting part, and I had a few notes here on that one. So when you talk about vesting, I mean, when a, when a master development plan is approved, at that point in time, that person has, by state law, they are given three years to develop that under the regulations that were in place at the time it was approved. To start. To start. Any portion or phase. Right. So they can start any portion or phase of that. They get three years. If in that three years they get a final, as state law calls it, final development plan approved for any phase of that particular development, they get an additional two years. So that's five years. Um, if they continue with all of their... They keep up with all of their permits. They keep up with everything they need to continue to construct that development. They can have vested rights up to 10 years for that development, meaning they can develop that project upwards of 10 years based on the zoning regulations and city regulations that were in place at the time it was initially approved. Now, if they do phasing, there's potential that can be all the way up to 15 years of vested rights. So city could make a lot of different changes to regulations in that 15 years, but based on state law, they can still develop based on that original plan 15 years, potentially 15 years in the past. So that, that to what Will was talking about, the vested rights, you know, that's, that's the key part of this master development plan. When this goes forward with the rezoning and the master development plan, once it's approved, they automatically have vested rights for three years for any part. And if they get any final plan approved as part of that, they get additional two years. That's a minimum. and has the potential for up to 10 years or 15 years, depending on if they phase it or not. So when I say this is a very foundational part, this is a very crucial part of the process for you all to be digging in and looking at what's the development going to look like, because this is going to set what this development will be at least for three years, five years, 10 years, maybe even 15 years how this is going to look. And there's going to be, even if your zoning ordinance gets completely wiped out and rewritten, it doesn't matter. They're still going to get to, they're going to get to develop based under the regulations that are in place when it was approved. So it could be 10 years later and they're still developing under, you know, the current zoning ordinance now. You could, you could wipe your zoning ordinance out next year, get a whole new zoning ordinance in place, and they would still get to develop under a zoning ordinance that's in currently in place right now. So that's the understanding of the, the importance of understanding your master development plan goes forward they're locked in for at least three years and potentially up to 15.
Well, well there, there are, so there are specifications in state law that says, you know, within that three year period, you do have to get a final approval. So once you do that, you can get another two. And if you're doing that, then you do have up to 10 years. Now, can a community be more restrictive than the state law? I guess potentially, but I'm not sure how that works. I don't know if there's been any, any case law on that or not. I mean, state law is saying you get three years and then you can get additional two, with just with any final approval. Um, they can come in with phase one, 10 lots, and get a final approval for that, and they get another two years for vested right. Uh, I would I would think so. Yeah, I would think so. I don't think you can make it applicable to something prior to it actually being in place, yeah. Yeah, I would have to... I'm not sure when those were adopted. Uh, let me see if... Actually, I don't, uh, I don't have the printed out. I don't remember exactly when the state law was updated for the new vested rights. It, it, was, it was fairly recent. Uh, essentially, the reason they did it was because there were so many communities throughout the state who had so many different regulations for vested rights. And the state said, nope, we're going to do it at state level. That way everybody knows what the, the plan is. Instead of this community having one and them having two and this having three, and they were like, nope, we're just going to do it at a state level. Everybody has this. 2014, okay. Essentially, that's what happened is every, there was a lot of communities were all over the place and very different throughout the state. So the state said, you know what, we're just going to do this. We're just going to um, make this state level or make a state law and it's just going to, it's going to regulate it all to a certain standard. So that's how we get the vested rights we have now. So, and, and, and like I said, it does specifically say maintains all, person has to maintain all required permits, certifications, approved plans and things like that. So it's not as though, hey, I come in and get this master development plan, I'm good for three years. And I mean, you, you, you're going to have to make sure you have all required permits, whether that be state, federal, local, whatever those permits are required, you're gonna to have to maintain all of those, keep, get those and maintain all of them to maintain that vested rights, to be able to continue to move forward into that, to developing the first phase, second phase, the whole development, whatever it may be, so. So, so in that case, it wouldn't necessarily be your master development plan, it would be uh, if it's a base zone and they're doing a uh, residential subdivision and they come in with a preliminary plat, then that's going to be their first approval. So their vested rights would start when they come in with a development plan, essentially their preliminary plat for development. That's their first plan to come forward. That's the first thing to get approved. And so if it's base zoning, it would be your development plan would be your first. That's where it would trigger vested rights. Planning Commission. That's not a BOC approval. That we're, we're saying master development plan simply because master development plan is tied with the rezoning, which requires BOC approval. But um, it would, in terms of just being a development plan, that stops with you all. And so whenever you make that, you all would make that approval uh, on a development plan, then that would trigger vested rights for a particular development if it was just a base zone, straight zone. Correct. That's correct. So state law, they have this, uh, what was it called, a preliminary development plan. That's like their general terminology for what they mean by that is the, essentially the first, first plan that is approved, uh, I can't remember the terminology, it shows the concept of the development. It's very general wording, so it's essentially the first thing that gets approved for a development that shows the overall layout and general design or concept of a property, of a, of a development. So it doesn't necessarily require it to be a master development plan like you all have or a development plan. Um, they just use the general terminology of preliminary development plan. And then they do give some, they, they do give a definition of what that is and it says, or other documents similar to, I think. So they make it very broad as far as what's a preliminary development plan that would trigger vested rights at the state level. I'd like to let everyone know that I've asked that this be video and audio only. So it's gonna be people yeah. I wanted them to have access to it so I don't know if that was mentioned but I, I did want to mention that it is audio and video tape so that you can refer back to it if needed okay. 
you mentioned the board zoning appeals. So that's not necessarily in this process, uh, but we can we can do that another time, or if we have time at the end, I can definitely touch on that as far as what they do. Uh, quickly, their, their state law restricts them to three things. They have three things they get to review, and that's pretty much it. And so BZ, uh, BZA would not have any step in this process in terms of um, master development plan uh, pod or, or anything like that, unless it comes falls under one of those three items, which makes it we can probably touch on that at the end maybe real quick as far as what that might be. Um, so we have the rezoning. We're going we're gonna to presume this goes forward and not like my slides not going forward. Um, so again, just the rezoning a little bit. Obviously, these are going to sound really repetitive at this point in time. Uh, obviously, staff's going to review this. Uh, we're going to be looking at 2040 plan. Is it in line with that? Future land use categories, land uses uh, permitted in that area, zoning district permitted under that classification. Obviously, you all know this is going to come to you all for recommendation and then go to VOC. Um, so again, very similar to the exact same thing in terms of annexation. Rezoning process is going to be the same in terms of getting to that final approval uh, for a rezoning or a rezoning with master development plan. Either, either way, it's going to end up with the same process. So uh, again, we're presuming that we have a planned overlay district. And so the next process in that, the next step in the process for that would be the submission of a development plan. Um, it can be submitted uh, for the entire development. It can just be specific to a, a phase, uh, just the entirety of a particular phase. It doesn't have to be first phase. It could be phase seven or 10, whichever one they desire to go with first. Um, it's going to be reviewed. Uh, it's going to be reviewed uh, on standards that are in Article 10 and 17 of your zoning ordinance. Uh, you all, as a planning commission, uh, you are going to approve a review and approve the development plan uh, under following requirements. You just have two um, two specific requirements there uh, that you can find in Section 10 of zoning ordinance. Again, we're staff's going to be looking at the development plan. We're going to be ensuring that this matches the master development plan. Like we just talked about, this is establishing the development, the overall design of the development, all the regulations. Uh, so obviously staff is going to be reviewing development plans uh, to ensure that it matches that. Um, we're gonna make sure it's kind of generally applicable or generally in compliance. Uh, once it comes to you all, you all are gonna be looking for that specific compliance. Is it substantially compliant once it gets to you all? Staff's gonna look at it and say, yes, it's generally compliant with what was approved for master development plan. It's gonna to come to you all and you all are going to be looking to make sure it's substantially compliant with what was approved as part of the master development plan. This is where you're going to get into your situation of, uh, have they made changes? Uh, they come in, have they made changes? Those changes, are they going to be what we consider a minor modification or a major modification? Um, so again, this is the step where that's going to come in. You've got your master development plan. Now the development plan's coming in. Does it look the same? Does it match road layout, intersections, access points, lot layout, number of lots, lot sizes, open space, percentages, we're going to make sure it matches that previous document. If not, uh, that's going to be where the discussion has to start. Is this a minor modification? Is it a minor, a major modification? And then what, what does that mean? Uh, if it's minor, it can be approved at uh, planning commission and can be incorporated into the development at that point in time and would not require uh, an update to the master development plan. If you all look at changes and say this is a major modification because and you go through that list that's in the zoning ordinance and you say it is a major modification because A, B, C, D, one, two, three, uh, then that's gonna require an updated master development plan and they're gonna go back to step one and they're gonna go back through the PC process to have that new master development plan or that updated master development plan approved. You, you have you have your you have your standards that you can go by. There's not it's not hard and fast on all of them. They're very general requirements. You can look at it and you make a determination: uh, is that minor? Is that major? Um, so no, there's not uh, hard and fast parameters in terms of this is absolutely a major and this is absolutely a minor. Uh, to be honest with you, most communities aren't hard and fast long. Uh, there's some aspects of it that can be pretty hard and fast. Uh, some communities say any increase in density. I don't mean. Technically, if you add one lot, it's technically an increase in density. So then you still kind of get, you can seem like your hard line, hey, any increase in density, that's a major modification. Well, it's only one lot. I added one lot. I mean, it's technically an increase in density, but it really did it affect the overall design of the project. Did it really change the project in a major way? So if you, sometimes you can have a requirement that seems pretty cut and dry, but kind of have to dig into that a little bit and say, well, is this really? 
So the, the general idea of the, behind that is a uh, project comes in and it's approved for 250 houses and they make some modifications and they come in and now we've reduced it to, you know, the idea is, well, the city was comfortable with 250. You've already approved it at this density. You've already approved it at this number of lots. So now we've come in, we've made modifications and they may even look major, they may even be major, but all those modifications has now shrunk it down. So essentially the city was comfortable with this level of development. Now the development is decreased in a certain way. Um, decreases are normally seen as minor just because it's a decrease in density, decrease in intensity of traffic on and out, in and out of the site. Uh, usually if you have a decrease in development, you're gonna have an increase in open space. Not always, but most of the time those things go hand in hand. So normally it would be seen as a minor. That doesn't mean it has to be, but um, most of the time it's probably usually seen that way. Have a list of ten items Correct. that determine if it's minor or major. Correct. Where are those? It's the zoning ordinance, and I think it's in uh, Article, yeah, Section Ten. I, I believe I believe staff can approve those, but essentially, we're, it's always going to be brought to you all for that determination of minor and major. Now, obviously, staff could come forward and say, hey, these are the changes. We feel these to be minor because they do not meet this threshold, this threshold, this threshold. And staff may make that recommendation to you all and say, hey, we feel like these are all minor changes because, you know, they, they added one lot. Or they changed this because they got on site and found wetlands and they can't build a road in that particular location because of a wetlands that they found or discovered or something like that. And it's maybe changes that are dictated by something that's discovered after that initial master development plan that really is Control of no control of the developer themselves. So, um, so I think staff could come forward and staff can make those recommendations, or or they can give their perspective that we feel like this is minor, but still bring it to you all for that final approval. Mm -hmm. I don't remember if that's on your list or not. I mean, that, that, that goes to the design review manual more than zoning ordinance. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything on that list that actually deals with the architectural design. Does it? I couldn't remember if it is on there or not. There you go. So, yes. Okay. And you all just haven't been a part of that discussion. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, my, my general thought is, and my background has always been, you pretty much have a work session every month, no matter what, uh, for, for just any general discussion topic. So um, that doesn't have to happen. That's not mandated by state law. You don't have to have a work session every month. Um, that's just been my experience as far as being on staff at local governments. Uh, I would think any time a staff got anything that came in in terms of modification, I would I would kind of default to hey this needs to have a work session just so everybody knows their changes. Now it may come in, you come to a work session, they may present it. You all may say, hmm, you know what, this is this is really not. We don't we don't really see this as a major. You can get some feedback in the very beginning of the process. Um, I, I'm I'm of the mindset that as soon as you see something that's changed, let's get it in front of you all so we can have discussion about that for everybody's sake, for planning commission, for developer, and for staff, so we can all understand and know that we're on the same. We're on the same. We're on the same track here. Going in the same direction from the very beginning. That they know there's a change to it. Again, there's no requirement for that, but I, I feel like that's just the best default to have, just so that as early as in the process as you can get, there's going to be everybody in, everybody knows, and there can be some general discussion. It's almost like you know we said that the first step is that initial initial meeting. You know, it's almost, I almost feel like it's that way. Hey, wait a minute. There's a change. We we need to have this almost initial meeting is on the same page. We know what's going on here. We know some changes that, have, that are coming. We know the changes that have been made. 
Now, the developer may go back from that. The developer may say, hey, I'm going to not make these changes. They may make different changes. You, know, you don't know, but at least everybody in the beginning has all the information up front. Now, obviously, that's, you know, you all are part of that process to be able to have that work session. When do you have it? When do you schedule it? You know, staff being open to that as well when it, whenever it has to happen. But I'm always on default to say let's have it as early as we can. Not to get you guys another meeting every month, but like I said, my, my experience has always just been we're going to have one anyway. Unless there's just nothing to discuss, then maybe it wouldn't happen. But uh, it's kind of just that default. So everybody's up to date on, on really anything process or in the, in the department, in the city. So. Again, the development plan, uh, back to this. So we're going to, it's going to come to you all. Uh, again, staff's going to make a recommendation. You're going to have your staff report. You're going to have all of your information. And the uh, the approval of this is going to end with you all. This uh, development plans do not require BOC approval. Uh, BOC is a legislative body uh, of the city. And so their, their uh, kind of responsibility in terms of development is really just going to be the annexation of the rezoning and master development plan. Uh, after that step, it's really going to end. It's going to end with you all and, and you all making your decision. Uh, in terms of the development plan, and um, so the next thing after development plan, we're going to have construction plans. And um, so it is, it is possible for a developer to turn in their construction plans and their development plan at the same time. Uh, it is a possibility. It is a potential for them to do that. They're not required to do that. And uh, if they don't turn them in at the same time, then at that point in time, they just turn them in at some point in time after the development plan is approved. <clears throat> uh, I think the main difference between development plan and construction plan is, is construction plans is really a very descriptive title. Um, it is literally the plans in which it will be constructed by. And so when you think of development plan and then you think of construction plans, construction plans are going to be all of your engineering information, your grading, uh, all of your pipe sizes, all of your information, all of your utility information, um, everything of that nature. So essentially, I mean, it is what is constructed by. So uh, that's the idea in terms of another level of detail, uh, greater level of detail. Uh, these are going to... Uh, these are going to come to staff, and uh, these uh, construction plans do not come to you all for review uh, or approval. Uh, the city engineer has authority to approve the construction plans. Uh, once that uh, they have had a discussion, comments have gone back and forth, uh, everything is up to a standard that is required by city engineer and by city requirements. City engineer uh, will then stamp those and sign off uh, saying this, these construction plans are approved and ready to be used for uh, the development. Uh, at that point in time, city engineer would draft up a, a development agreement and also an estimate of, your, of the performance bond for the project as well. Um, those would come to you all uh, in BOC just for approval and form, but not to execute those. Uh, uh, so again, construction plans uh, would not come to you all or the BOC for approval. The approval would uh, approval authority sets with the city engineer in terms of construction plans. We're not running right up on time here. Um, we're, we're, we're talking specifically about right. construction plan. Yeah. Building plans. And one other thing about the uh, construction plans to understand, too, uh, you know, another thing that staff will be doing, uh, specifically city, city engineer during this time, you know, they'll be verifying that all, like, third-party permitting uh, is is completed during this time. Anything that's required from TDEC, TDOT, any, any outside agency that is required and that is requiring a permit for this development, uh, staff will also be verifying that those are 
uh, in hand uh, during the construction plans process as well. So that's something that you all wouldn't see, but staff is doing, say, quote unquote, behind the scenes, verifying that those requirements are met that's in the subdivision regulations before they're going to approve the construction plans. Um, so once, once we have everything in terms of our master development plan and then our development plan and then our construction plans approved, uh, now we're gonna get to the point of the actual final plat coming forward. Uh, this is the next step that you all be, uh, have a development in front of or a project in front of you for review and approval. Um, so again, we mentioned, you know, one of those five documents we mentioned earlier, subdivision regulations, that obviously sets standards and the processes for subdivision of property. So uh, any final plat that comes before you, we're gonna, we're gonna ensure that those uh, meet those requirements and processes that are established in the subdivision regulations. Um, again, this could be for the entire development. It could be for a specific phase within that development. Um, and uh, we're gonna go back to section 10. That's where the standards are in place or established for uh, you all planning commission having the authority to review and approve uh, a subdivision plat, final plat uh, for development. So again, we're, we're gonna be, staff's gonna be looking at these, we're gonna be reviewing them, make sure they match. Essentially, we're looking for uh, compliance all the way back to the master development plan, development plan, construction plans. We're making sure all of this is uh, compliant throughout and consistent throughout. And uh, that's the key part that we're gonna be doing and then bringing that forward to you all. And again, you all would have the final decision on the final plat, approving it. Um, and then again, BOC does not have any role in uh, considering or approving a plat at this point in time. Right off. So post approval, uh, and with Will and, and everybody in the back, they may they'll be able to provide some more information to this. I don't want to get too deep into this, but just for you all to understand, um, you know, we we can get to the end of the process in terms of the actual uh, subdivision, residential subdivision. A final plat can be approved; it can be ready to be recorded. Um, and you all, at that point in time, your your role in terms of reviewing and approving those documents are really complete at that point in time. However, after that, there's a lot of other things that go on uh, that you all may not see, but does go on by staff, and that's going to include, include um, reviewing, uh, approving, and, and issuing uh, your grading permit, land disturbance permits, uh, calculating bond amounts, that you all, you all do hear about that at the meetings, uh, but ensuring those bonds are in place, uh, staff's going to be ensuring all of those. Uh, once the development's completed, they're gonna be requiring making sure as-built plans are submitted to the city, which is a requirement within your subdivision regulations. Um, get into, obviously gonna get into the building permit process, but spe specifically on site inspections for individual lots, also site inspections for their all of development, looking at erosion control measures being in place. Um, and then eventually you're gonna to get to acceptance of dedication of public infrastructure. So your roads, utilities, anything of that nature. Um, again, I, I don't want to get too deep in all of this. I know we have staff back there. If you have questions, they can probably help you a little bit more on this. But just kind of give you all an idea that, you know, once the final plat's approved, there's really not going to be any more plans that come forward. Uh, but there is a lot of other things that will occur uh, after that approve, that final approval of that final plat. Uh, and these are all going to be handled by staff. Construction continues forward and moves forward on that particular development. And I will... I will end it there. I want to make sure we weren't too pushed up against planning commission meeting time. Um, glad to try to answer any questions or anything else. Again, I, I know you said it was going to be recorded, both audio and video. I did send a PDF to Ethan earlier, so there should be a PDF of it if you all would like to just have a PDF of the, of the presentation as well. No, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll send him a new one. I found some misspelled words and such, so I'll send him another one tomorrow morning. But... Uh, but he'll have that if you all would just like to have a PDF of it as well on top of the recording, the video and audio recording. Real quick in terms of the board zoning appeals. Um, so state law uh, is very specific on what they can review and what they have purview over. And they can look at variances, uh, special exceptions, or conditional uses, uh, whatever the terminology is used, and then also administrative appeals. Uh, so those are the three project types that a Board of Zoning Appeals can review. Anything outside of that, they have no authority to review. So they can't look at a site plan. They can't look at a plat. Uh, they can't do anything of that nature or give any type of uh, approval for anything outside of someone coming and requesting a variance from <clears throat> a zoning requirement and zoning ordinance or a conditional use special exception, which is essentially um, 
I have a property, it's owned a certain way, and there are certain uses that may be appropriate in that location, and a person would have to come forward and say, I'm meeting all these requirements that would make this use appropriate on this particular property, and then Board Zoning Appeals could approve that particular land use uh, or a particular piece of property. So, <clears throat> as Will mentioned earlier, you, know, you have every property and has, every, has so many rights that are just <clears throat> by right, by law. If I have a property zoned a certain way, by right, I can do any of those uses. And then you're gonna have certain uses that are conditional or special exception. Meaning if I meet certain conditions, then I could, I can do one of these uses there. So the Board of Zoning Appeals is gonna have authority to uh, review and approve those particular uses, um, or they can review and approve variances for a particular zoning requirement within zoning ordinance. Uh, or anybody, if they disagree with, we'll say Ethan, interprets the zoning ordinance in a particular way and someone disagrees with that, then they can appeal that to the Board of Zoning Appeals. Have their opportunity to prove that Ethan was incorrect in his interpretation and they believe it to be interpreted a different way. Essentially what they can do in terms, they, they kind of become a quasi-judicial board at that point in time saying, hearing, essentially hearing arguments from city staff that says, well, this is the way you've interpreted it. Um, and then Whoever is, feels aggrieved, they can come in and say, no, they did it incorrectly. Uh, we feel it should be interpreted this way. And then Board Zoning Appeals will set, and essentially the judge almost, and they'll make a determination on who is the interpretation or decision that that was made. But that, that's the three things that uh, BZA can do, and that's all they can do. So state law is very specific on what they can and can't do. Uh, if you have a planning commission, you're required to have a BZA, because you have to have that essentially safety valve for situations that might come up um, because your zoning ordinance doesn't, is not gonna fit perfectly on every property. Um, obviously properties were developed and subdivided many years before zoning was in place in most communities. So you're gonna have properties that are shaped like pizza slices and they're gonna be have sinkholes and have really severe topography and people are just not gonna be able to meet your zoning requirements. And so a variance in the board zoning appeals is a process to relieve some of that. Or it can be a situation, uh, you know, I dealt with a project in a former community I worked for uh, where TDOT widened the road and they literally took half the guy's property. I mean, no buy, no, no act of his own. TDOT said, we're riding it, so we're taking half your property and he just wanted to rebuild his house back and he just couldn't meet all the setbacks. And so um, he was given a variance to build a, build, build a house back. <clears throat> so it can be a situation like that as well, where an outside agency has created some type of hardship on a property that Someone can come to BZA and get a relief there through the variance. A lot of times you'll see hardships like with pools, five-yard setbacks like that because of So you cannot give a variance for a land use. So board zoning appeals cannot say, oh, well, this land use is not permitted here, but we'll let you do this land use on that property. They're not permitted to do that. Board zoning appeals is restricted from doing a land, uh, particular land use variance. You can't do that. Um, courts have specifically said that is them stepping into the legislative role of the community, which they obviously are not a legislative body. So they cannot do any type of use variance. They can't just say, oh yeah, you can do that use there. Even though, if it's not permitted there, they can't just say, oh yeah, I can do that. There are specific ones that they may be able to do that they can approved, but if it's just not listed, they can't, they can't just say, oh yeah, you can do that use. Um, so that, that's one thing I would bring up for sure. That's a big thing that you might be surprised how many communities let that happen. But that's really the big difference there in the variance. You can't use the use variance, but you do have special exception uses that they can approve. So similar, but not exactly the same. Any other questions or anything like that? Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah. Hopefully it was somewhat informative. I know y'all see this every month, so it may have been a little repetitive and boring at times. So but I was trying to just... I think there's been a lot of misinformation. Hey, if that's what we can do, clear it up, and that's, that's, that's excellent as well, be able to clear up everything. It's good to have. Correct. Right. You all have any topics, other topics you'd like to know about, we'll be glad to 
we're glad to do that as well. So, I, this is, I mean, I have a whole presentation on BZA. It, I mean, if, if that's something you all really want to hear about, I mean, I have a whole presentation on BZA and what they can. Yeah, I'll say, I can send that to you. Yeah. Yep, state law requires them all. <laughs>